the South Asian country is suffering severe shortages of essential goods, high inflation and crippling power blackouts. The country took loans worth $45 billion from various countries, including more than $8 billion from China. All 26 ministers of the cabinet quit all together just late last night. High inflation, shortage of basic essentials and riots are spreading rapidly across the entire country. Shashi Dhanatunga, an economist, has said the loans taken from China triggered the misery in Sri Lanka. Hi everybody, in the past couple of weeks we've all been hearing about the terrible economic state of Sri Lanka and how much the condition has blown out of control. Inflation has hit a horrific 17.5%, school exams have been cancelled due to lack of ink and paper, cabinet ministers have resigned and by the time you watch this episode, maybe the president might have quit too. And while most of us will ignore it because it has got nothing to do with us in India, I got to tell you that it is very very important to study the failure of Sri Lanka. Why? Because it has got some very very important pointers by which we can keep a check on our government so that we don't end up like Sri Lanka. So in this episode today, we are going to put out the simplest explanation as to what exactly went wrong with Sri Lanka, how did the government of Sri Lanka recklessly slip the country into an economic crisis and most importantly, as citizens of India, what are the checks that we need to keep on the government of India so that we don't end up like Sri Lanka. This video is brought to you by Kuku FM, but more on this at the end of the video. Chalo, let's start from the basics and try to understand the context first. Sri Lanka is a diverse country with three major ethnic groups. 75% of the country are Sinhalese, 11% form the Sri Lankan Tamils and 4.2% are Indian Tamil. And the problem with Sri Lanka started way back in 1948 itself, when they came up with something called the Ceylon Citizenship Act. This act was specifically aimed to turn Sri Lanka into a land where only Sinhalese citizens live. And they did that by putting two important qualifiers in the act. Number one, this act granted citizenship to only those people who had 10 years of uninterrupted residence in Sri Lanka and whose income slab was above a certain stipulated level. So the question is, the Sri Lankan Tamils were living in Sri Lanka for a very long time, right? So what is the problem? Well, the catch over here was that the Sri Lankan Tamils often had the habit of visiting India to visit their relatives. And hence, most of them did not qualify under this uninterrupted residence clause. On top of that, many Tamils also could not meet the stipulated income slabs either. So when filtered through both these criteria, there were only 1 lakh Tamils who were granted citizenship under this act, which meant what? 7 lakh people were no longer citizens of Sri Lanka. In fact, over 3 lakh Tamils were even deported back to India. So 7 lakh people were deliberately, systematically and legally isolated in their own motherland, which meant no jobs, no property and no rights. And once this move was made, the Sinhalese groups also started torturing the Tamils to move them out of the country. And what followed next was an unthinkable level of atrocity and violence that I cannot even put into words. And the worst part is that all of these atrocities are said to have happened with the support of the state itself. This is where, in the 1960s, we saw the rise of rebels who started forming groups to take on the government head-on. And one of these rebels was a man named Velu Pillai Prabhakaran who formed a guerrilla organization called Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam or LTTE. This organization was specifically aimed at creating an independent state for the Tamils in Sri Lanka in the northern and the eastern part of the country. And in the next 10 years, LTT went on to become one of the most well-armed and ruthless insurgent groups in the world with their own army, with their own navy and even their own air force. And when LTT and the government of Sri Lanka both came head-on, it led to a massive civil war in Sri Lanka. Our people have lost patience, lost hope and reached the brink of utter frustration. They're not prepared to be tolerant any longer. It's a war that has lasted on and off for a quarter of a century not only on land, but also at sea. Tamil Tigers, as they're known, took up their armed struggle in the 1970s as a reaction to the increasing discrimination against the Tamil minority. Late today, Sri Lankan special forces reportedly ambushed and killed the leader of the Tamil Tigers. The Sri Lankan army has tightened its grip on the remaining Tamil forces. His death adds emphasis to the end of the Tamil's 26-year bid to create an independent ethnic homeland. And for the next 26 years, from 1983 to 2009, the LTT did everything in its capacity with violence and non-violence to gain a place for the Tamils in Sri Lanka. And needless to say, it was bloody as hell. But finally, the civil war came to an end when Prabhakaran was killed by the Sri Lankan army in May 2009. 
Now, although the Sri Lankan army claimed victory over LTT, the damage had already been done. 80 to 100,000 lives were lost, the economy was in ruins, and instead of developing the country post independence, Sri Lanka wasted 26 years in a futile civil war, which ended up costing the country $200 billion. And this is where the phase 2 of the deterioration started. Now you see guys, for any country to develop from a downfall, the course of action is a 5 step procedure. Step 1. Identify unique asset or strength of your country. Step 2. Use it to add value to the global economy. Step 3. When you add value to the global economy, money will flow into your country from your foreign clients. And once this happens, you can use this money to develop your country, grow your existing value proposition and create more assets to deliver more value to the global economy. Now this asset could be anything. For China, it was ultra cheap labor for the electronics and textile industry. For Taiwan, it was the semiconductor industry. For Singapore, it was labor, ports and tax regulation. And for the Middle East, it was oil. Now in case of Sri Lanka, one of the most valuable assets was this port called the Humban Tota Port. This is Sri Lanka's second largest port and it handled 1.8 million tons of LPG and dry bulk cargo in 2020. And the reason why this port is super important is because number one, Humban Toto is close to two of the most important international shipping routes which pass through the Swiss Canal and the Strait of Malacca. These routes through Humban Tota are used by about 36,000 ships including 4,500 oil tankers. And this port saves about three days of sailing time and fuel. Secondly, the deep water terminal facility of Humban Tota has the capacity to berth the largest of ships with utmost ease and efficiency. On top of that, it also has ample space for storage and also has dry weather throughout the year. Thirdly, using this port, Sri Lanka can even tap into the market of fuel depots in both Singapore and Fujairah, which are two of the largest fuel depots in the world that supply over 60 million tons of fuel per year. This is the reason why the Sri Lankan government was very keen on developing this port. But as we all saw, due to the 26 years of civil war, the Sri Lankan government could not offer the capital to build this port or other projects completely by themselves. And guess what? Here's where a dear friend shows up. And this dear friend was so nice that it supplied weapons to the government, invested money in long-term projects and even shielded Sri Lanka in the United Nations using their veto power. This friend was none other than the generous state of China. And one of these long-term projects was the development of the Humban Tota Port. So you know what? China deployed a genius strategy to trap Sri Lanka. The worst part is that it's not just Sri Lanka, but 40 other economically weaker nations that China is trapping right now. The question is, what is this trap and how does it actually play out? Very, very simple. Step number one, since China knows that it's difficult for the economically weaker nations like Sri Lanka to get heavy loans either from the World Bank or other countries, China shows up and gives them an unbelievable amount of loan. In this case, China gave away a billion dollar loan to Sri Lanka to build the Humban Tota port. Then comes step two, which are conditions. The first condition that China put forth in front of Sri Lanka and other countries is that to get this loan, mostly only Chinese companies get the contract for such development projects. So basically, China will give you $1 billion in loan and then you will have to give these $1 billion to a Chinese company to build the port for you. And this company will actually get you Chinese workers who will actually get paid by the exact same money that was actually loaned to you. And the worst part is that these Chinese companies can even overbill you in case if they think that the project needs more money. And for this money, you might have to go back to China again. So practically, the money is mostly flowing back to China, but on paper, you will owe a billion dollar debt to China along with a hefty interest. In this case, the company that built the Humban Tota port was a company called China Harbor. On top of that, the second condition is that these loans are guaranteed by a cash deposit by the recipient countries in the bank accounts controlled by China. For example, you will have to keep $200 million in a Chinese controlled bank account and if you cannot pay back the loan or the interest, China can directly withdraw the money from that account. And lastly, while the World Bank lenders give out loans at 1-2% to interest, China very generously offers these loans at 4-6% to interest. On top of that, while conventional lenders' loan repayment tenure is usually 28 to 30 years, Chinese loans are mostly to be repaid in just 10 to 15 years. So basically, you pay more interest in lesser time with cash deposits that are completely in the hands of the Chinese. Now the question over here is, if these countries are economically so weak, 
how can they actually pay back these loans with such high interest well guess what china knows that they cannot pay back the loan so the question is is this a loss venture for china well not really because here's where step 3 comes in which is control here's where if you cannot pay back the loan china directly takes over your asset and starts using it for itself and this is exactly what happened with the humban dota port china gave away a billion dollar loan to sri lanka with 6.3% interest and since the government could not pay back the loan china took away the humban dota port for a 99 year lease along with an additional 15000 acres of land now if you look at what china got out of it you will see that it got all the benefits of the port's strategic position plus it gets a military advantage with a proximity to india and most importantly if you look at these kind of projects on the map of sri lanka you will see that this did not happen once or twice but over and over and over again for road projects coal power plants railways airports housing complexes and a lot more and the total amount of these loans from china alone amounts to 12 billion dollars now the question over here is what the hell does china get out of all of this well this needs a separate video altogether i'm not covering this due to information overload but if you want me to cover it do drop a comment below and just like tanishk i will cover it up very very soon coming back to sri lanka on top of the mounting debt the tourism industry which formed 10 to 12% of sri lanka's gdp completely collapsed both due to covid and the easter bombings then due to the russia ukraine war the crude oil prices shot up which meant that a major chunk of sri lanka's foreign reserves were bleeding away just to buy oil this and a lot more bad loans and bad investments started increasing the foreign debt of sri lanka to a very very dangerous level and if you look at this graph you will see that it actually rose to 119% of the gdp in 2021 foreign reserves are depleted from 9.9 billion dollars in 2018 to just 2.3 billion dollars by february 2022 now the question over here is the sri lankan politicians are not illiterate right even they have got qualified leaders who can understand basic finances then how the hell did they so recklessly take up money and deteriorate the economy to such a pathetic level well long story short a large part of the government was controlled by just one family and all thanks to their extraordinary dedication for corruption the country's economy has got every possible step wrong from 2005 to 2015 it was under a man named mahinda rajapaksha and this is where the chinese debt trap happened from 2015 to 2019 it was under a man named siri sena followed by gotabaya rajapaksha who is none other than mahinda's brother on top of that the chinese also funded the election where unrealistic subsidies and freebies were distributed these subsidies did get them votes but they also put corrupt people in charge and today gotabaya mahinda they are two older brothers and mahinda's son oversee departments and agencies that collectively control nearly 70% of sri lanka's budget now you can imagine how easy it would have been to take bad decisions with a few hundred crore in bribe in exchange for billions of dollars of public property hand over to china this is how ladies and gentlemen because of a bloody civil war because of over concentration of power because of corruption and bad financial decisions today the citizens of sri lanka are facing an economic crisis that is only getting worse by the day and this brings me to the most important part of the episode and that are the lessons that we as citizens of india need to learn from the failure of sri lanka so that we can keep a good check on the government of india but before we move on i want to thank our partners kuku fm for supporting our content people if you want to know more about geopolitics in your own regional language i would suggest you to listen to the changing world order show on kuku fm kuku fm is india's leading audiobook platform with over 1000 hours of content library with over 4.5 plus rating and a huge library of non fiction content my recent favorite book summaries on their platform are the art of war and the theft of india And if these kind of subjects intrigue you then use the code think20 to get a 20% discount on the subscription. On top of that, the first 1000 people can get a 50% discount if you use think50 through the link in the description. Moving on, the first lesson that we need to learn is that communal segregation is one of the biggest threats for the economy and the peace of the country. Which is why if you see, no country that persecuted the minorities ever made great progress. And at the same time, every country that overcame communal segregation is sitting on top of the world today. Classic example being Singapore. But in this case, if you see, 
द सिविल वॉर कॉस्टेड श्रीलंका टू हंड्रेड बिलियन डॉलर ट्वेंटी सिक्स ईयर्स ऑफ गोल्डन टाइम टू ग्रो एंड मोर इंपॉर्टेंटली द लाइफ ऑफ एटी टू हंड्रेड थाउजेंड पीपल एंड गॉड नोज हाउ मेनी एनिमल्स लॉज देयर लाइफ ड्यूरिंग द वॉर एंड ड्यूरिंग बॉम्बिंग्स सो ऑलवेज कीप एन आई ऑन द गवर्मेंट एंड नेवर लेट दम सेग्रिकेट कम्युनिटीज बेस्ड ऑन क्लास कास्ट और रिलीजन लेसन नंबर टू Every time power is concentrated with one man or one family or one party or even one company it is more likely to lead to a disaster and you will see this everywhere starting from the roman empire to nestle to sri lanka to even venezuela so always keep an eye on the political and business monopolies because they might often cross their lines to become super powerful and they will end up ruining your society and lastly always choose your partners and investors very very carefully in this case We saw how Sri Lanka made a terrible decision of taking money from China and today it is nothing but a puppet that stuck with a debt trap. So as citizens, you need to keep a very close eye on your government to make sure that they don't get too cozy with the wrong players, whether that is the US, China or for that matter any other country. And more importantly, always remember, freebies can win you votes, but they can never ever build an economy. That's all from my side for today guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to the like button in order to make YouTube baba happy. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.